Hello, and welcome to Conversations with Nick Thompson. You may know me from Netflix Love is Blind, but on this podcast, we sit down with guests from all walks of life to hear their story, remove stigmas, and uncover what makes them tick. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Conversations with Nick Thompson podcast. I am here to have a wonderful conversation today. Um, today, we have a author, best-selling author, who wrote a book titled Gratitude and Pasta, and at this moment has a new book, Gratitude Through Hard Times. His name is Chris Shembra. He has a lot of vulnerability to him, and that's what attracted me to speaking with him to get him here on the show. Uh, he's actually been recognized for being a top stigma breaker when it comes to mental health for men, which is something I think is a very personal topic to myself and to a lot of people. So we'll get into his books, but what I really want to talk to him about is how he uses gratitude to get himself through these hard times. And I haven't had the opportunity to read his new book yet because it hasn't come out, but he sent me uh, the opening for it. And reading the challenges that Chris, and I know many of us face on a day-to-day basis to overcome some of these mental health challenges that we face day to day, I was particularly interested to talk to him about how he found gratitude and how he discovered how it could change his life. But it's interesting because the same things that help Chris when he is struggling are the same things that you can easily lose when you're struggling. So I can't wait to talk to him about not just breaking mental health stigmas, especially for men, uh, considering he, he's a man, I'm a man, and, and we both have our own experiences. But I want to talk to him about how he personally has ups and downs like all of us, but he's so vulnerable and open to sharing those times. And he's transparent in a way that he can speak about many things that have happened to him challenges that he faces day to day and how in so many cultures mental health is taboo to speak of in general but especially here with men because we're supposed to be masculine we're supposed to be strong we're not supposed to talk about our emotions we're not supposed to cry Uh, you're not supposed to have any of these types of challenges because it could be viewed as weakness and Chris talks about him he talked about him in the first chapter to his book that he sent me over to read And we're going to talk about him in this interview, and we're going to get deep into the roots of how he's become the person he is, how he's become a best-selling author, how even after becoming a best-selling author, he had more challenges to overcome, overcoming them to this day. And what I wanted to do there is share a little bit of my own experience as someone who did grow up not really having the outlet to share the way that I was feeling. And I'll share some of that with him as well. But for all of you, I grew up um, with depression that I did not know that I had. And I wasn't really sure what it was, why I was feeling the ways that I was feeling, why I was perpetually sad, why I was perpetually not wanting to engage with family, with friends. Um, and you know, a lot of self care and self work over the years. And believe me, it hasn't been easy. And there's still so many ups and downs. You know, I realized that it's actually okay to share these things. And I have a lot of work personally to do there because I am not that good at sharing things and sharing how I feel. I tend to shut down and, and withdraw, which is a common symptom for those of you who have experienced it, or you are familiar with someone who has. And when I withdraw, it's funny in a sense because it actually makes things worse but at the same time it also gives me time to sit with it because I feel it's important to to sit with it and know that it's okay to feel sad it's okay to be depressed it's okay to have anxiety or PTSD but what's more important is that we forgive ourselves for having these things we allow ourselves to have these feelings, sort of acceptance, so that we can build our way out of it 
and build a way that works for us. And that comes through talking about it. And that's exactly what I'm hoping to do in just a few minutes here with Chris. But for all of you men, women, people who experience anxiety, depression, mental health challenges, uh, any type of fear of sharing that, I hope you hear a conversation and I hope we have a conversation today that helps you feel more comfortable and know that it's okay to talk about these things. And for those of us who have accepted this or want to accept this and be more open with our loved ones, with our friends and family to talk about this, I would have a little piece of, of I don't want to say advice, but a little strategy. Um, listen, when someone comes to you and they're your friend or they're your family and they want to talk to you about their mental health, listen, you don't have to fix it. You don't have to tell them what to do. You don't have to give them a list of advice like go for a walk, get some sunshine, do you. Just listen. Let them feel comfortable in sharing their challenges and be a friend or a family member and support them and reassure them it's okay and that they have a support system and that they have people that love them and they have people that are going to support them no matter what. Before we get away to this interview with Chris, I just want to say my hope is that anybody who listens to this interview finds strength in themselves to talk openly about any challenges and struggles that you're facing. I hope it encourages friends and family of those who struggle to open up and listen and show compassion and empathy. And most of all, I hope that it helps us remove some of the stigmas around these difficult conversations and difficult challenges that so many of us face, myself included. So without further ado, I'd like to get to this interview and introduce you all to a wonderful guest and a wonderful conversation. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Nick Thompson. This is Conversation with Nick Thompson. Today, we have an amazing guest joining us. His name is uh, Chris Shremba. Some of you may know him as the Gratitude Guru. He's a best-selling author of uh, Gratitude and Pasta, The Secret Sauce for Human Connection. He has a new book titled Gratitude Through Hard Times, which we'll talk about today. And he's the founder of the 747 Club, an organization dedicated to building and strengthening business relationships through gratitude. And he has been recognized as one of the most successful men in breaking the mental health stigma, which is outstanding to hear. So Chris, welcome to the show. How are you? Nick, thanks for having me on. You know, it's a uh... It's a wonderful time to be having this very important conversation. It's a one day before our book launch tomorrow on June 21st. And and what a 15-month journey it's been to get here, filled with many ups and many downs. And so I'm excited to have a courageous conversation with you today. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Chris. And I'm, I'm ha happy to have you on, but more happy that you're so open and vulnerable with uh, what you go through on a day-to-day -day basis and how you've gotten to where you are. So I'm excited to get into that today. Thank you. So I like to start all of these conversations with a little bit of irony. So uh, where are you at today, Chris? And tell me, what is the weather like? I am uh, I'm in my home office here in our beautiful home in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, New York City, United States of America. We've got the ginkgo trees outside that were planted 12 years ago. The sun is shining. Uh, the world is is uh, opening up for a fresh new day. So uh, my girlfriend's getting her toenails painted, and uh, we're getting ready for the book launch tomorrow. It's amazing. <laughs> That's outstanding. Um, do you want to do you want to quickly mention your your book a little bit? Yeah, gr uh, you know, gra gratitude through hard times, finding positive benefits through our darkest hour. Um, you know, I imagine we're going to talk about that in just a little bit, but it's been 15 months in the making, 320 pages, a bunch of great science, psychology, and ancient Stoic philosophy on the true core principles of gratitude. I know some of you watching this today, you're probably sitting here saying, oh no, not one of those positive blah, blah gratitude guys. <laughs> well, I, I got a truth to tell you and you're going to hear about it later on. I'm not that woo woo positivity, spiritual gratitude guy. Everything we do is rooted in science and psychology. We're about helping you find the positive benefits through your darkest hour. So um, you know, more on the, the hard skills approach to life kind of gratitude side. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I'm excited to hear about it. And having uh, been able to read the introduction prior to, mm -hmm. to meeting with you today, um, there's some really, really, really good content, but really, really good storytelling on your behalf and the ability, again, to be vulnerable and, and talk freely about how you have had ups and downs and how that led you to, um, you know, find gratitude. Before we get into that, though, just to kind of break the ice, Chris, I'm going to ask you 20 lightning round questions, and I'm going to ask you these questions. They're fun. They're, they're easygoing, and you just answer with the first thing that comes to your mind. Deal. And beware, there's going to be people watching, and some of these... Our, uh, I hope you don't upset anyone, especially with the first one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so uh, first question for lightning round. Who is your best friend? Scott. Oh, Molly and then Scott. Molly's my partner, Scott. Perfect. What kind of landscape would you live in? Beach in the front yard, uh, marsh with a boat dock in the backyard. So Brahms <laughs> Point on Hilton Head Island, South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> what were you most afraid of as a child? Not being seen or heard or understood. Ooh, good one. What's one subject you would like to learn more about? Listening to my gut. What's a good spy code name for you? A curious killer. <laughs> What's the last song you've listened to? Broadway cast of Alexander Hamilton, probably nonstop. I listened to the whole album twice this morning. <laughs> Dude, oh, wow. I did the, Pelot I did the ha Hamilton Peloton ride this morning as well. <laughs> oh, wow, you're at it this morning. I'm like oh, barely yeah. get my coffee down. And <laughs> uh, what's your favorite board game? My friend Steve Tam and Esther Perel uh, built a wonderful uh, game based on questions and curious conversations around uh, love and sex and language and all these great things very curious very brave game awesome i love that what is uh one thing you wish you enjoyed more myself Ooh, we'll get into that <laughs> one <laughs> what's the coolest feature of your home floor to ceiling windows in every room very bright light or maybe this bookshelf <laughs> Um, or or or, or a, a ten foot long island kitchen, uh, the uh, the 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 kitchen counter is a, a wonderful that leads into the the big living room. But uh, oh. the, the we got a wonderful island kitchen counter, which is very rare for New York City, and two full huge bathtubs with a four person shower in each. Oh. That's amazing. And, and a, a, a bathtub big enough for my friend Scott, who's six, th six three and three quarters. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's as a, I'm six five, shoulders. so I I can relate so, to uh, so that. I, I like I got fired by a client four years ago because leading up to his 90th birthday party, I said that my best friend Scott was six five, and I can't wait for you to meet him. And blah blah blah, blah. and he emailed me the day after the party saying you're a liar you're fired your friend's not six five are you kidding me and i texted scott i was like yo send me a fucking photo of your license plate it's, it's like it's essentially six three and three quarters so i was like oh my god i'm a liar <laughs> scott Makes could a have been difference. a really cool guy if he was just an inch and a quarter taller <laughs> so maybe should we re-ask the the best friend pod a question again so you can yeah name someone he's who's cost me a, he's cost me a lot of business <laughs> god dang it uh, well, you could be my new best friend nick there six we go five perfect <laughs> you don't look that tall on tv i mean you look tall but six five is a whole nother that's another thing you know it's funny because i never think of it anymore like i'm yeah i'm six five i'm tall but i'm so used to it and i only notice it when i'm in photos and i'm like whoa i'm like way yeah. taller than everyone else <laughs> Dude, so I I used to put Scott in my like dating profile, like like my hinge and my bumble, and I'd be like, hey, I have a friend. Except he'd be like <laughs> six, three and three quarters, and I'd be five eight, and so nobody would match with me. Oh they'd see my me, gosh. they'd be like, Are you the midget? Like, are you the tiny guy? And I'd be like, uh, this kind of hurts my feelings, but that's so why... shallow. <laughs> I know, whatever. Whatever. Man, 
Man. I met my girl. I, I Molly, I didn't have to meet on a dating app. Thank God. We were introduced by my third cousin, Nicole uh, Puleo oh, okay. Cooper, who just had two twins. And uh, what a wonderful connection that was. It was the first time I was ever set up with a girl in my life. That's wow. a story for and another look day. look at that. Look yeah. at that. You two I'm are. Not a very, I'm not a very referable guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's the 5'8 thing. But you know what? Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> thanks, kidding. Nick. Thanks, I'm Nick. Kidding. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> you know You know what it is? I call it the, um, I call it the catalyst dilemma. So, mm. so similar to you, I've always been known for knowing people. You know, I, I've always been known for galvanizing people. I've always been known for bringing good people together. But the problem with that is, because I know what it, I know what it feels like to be alone. Mm-hmm. I know what it feels like to always be the last one called to the party. My invite was always somehow lost in the mail. I had a great group of best friends growing up, um, but I convinced myself that I was always being left out of the party. And uh-huh. so that's why I started hosting all these dinners and gatherings and experiences and bringing people together. But the problem with that is everybody just assumes you're being taken care of by another group. So why invite Chris? He's probably yeah. going to say no. Yeah. So nobody was ever introducing me to girls because they're like, ah, he lives on the beach. He meets tourist girls while surfing. He's probably <laughs> fine. But in reality, yeah. no. No, I wanted yeah. those introductions. Yeah, that's so interesting because you mentioned that in in the uh, beginning of the book, and yeah. I want I have a couple questions to to ask you about that. Um, but I it's interesting because it is other people's perception is so off from reality in so many instances. It's it's crazy to really really think about how people come to these assumptions. One one of the things that we've learned through the years is that you must never assume you know how anybody else is feeling around you. So, Nick, one of the cool things that we've had the opportunity to do over the last seven years, which we'll get into, is just really bring a lot of good people together. And Mm -hmm. one of the things we like to ask at the start of bringing any group together is a simple sentence that I challenge your listeners and and watchers to, to think about for a sec. What's one word that honestly describes how you feel right now in the moment. Think about that for a sec, folks. I don't know what y'all are going through. Some of you might be quarantined alone. Some of you might be stuck with people you can't wait to get rid of. Some people might be back on the road traveling every day. I don't know what you're going through. But be real for a sec. Are you tired? Are you nervous? Are you cautious? Are you anxious? Are you overwhelmed? Are you sad? Are you grateful? Are you happy? Are you optimistic? Are you hopeful? See, the odds are there's someone in this planet that's probably going through a similar life situation as you, but they might take an opposite feeling or perspective to the situation. You could be working a nine to five, showing up to work every day, hanging out with your friends on the weekend, playing around a golf, doing a backyard barbecue, And you could have someone who's doing the exact same thing, except you're hopeful and they're anxious. Or you're anxious and they're hopeful. And that perspective is something that is very important to keep in touch with because some of the people around you could look like they have a perfect life, but on the inside, they're actually screaming. and They need your support. And that has just been amplified, in my opinion, with the last couple years of having people get more digital in their communication, become more disconnected from people. It's the more we get connected, the more disconnected we seem to get. And when you have social media and you have social media out there, you can be whoever you want to the entire world. And I think going through the experience that I went through with, with love is blind, like I can see nobody nobody knows what that was like and nobody knows what it's been like but people assume because they saw an hour and 14 minutes of your life across 10 episodes of a reality TV show that they know who you are and that they don't or they see a friend or family or someone is to your point who's happy through social media and you find out on the inside they're not And that's the challenge that I think we as a society need to figure out how to overcome as we get more digitally connected and less physically connected. Nick, thank you for sharing that. 
and uh, you know it, it it takes a brave and courageous person to acknowledge that life isn't everything that it appears to be on TV. What's what's one moment of adversity you were overcoming in your life that didn't get shown on air that nobody really knows about? Um, that's a good. <laughs> you did spin it around. That's a good question. Um, I was working so much at the time that I almost didn't leave to go film the show, uh, because I was so busy. Our, uh, CMO at the time had resigned shortly before I was leaving to film and I had to jump in as interim CMO, which was new to me. And so I s stepped away for three weeks without any connectivity um, from a team that was not having very much guidance and very uneasy about all the changes going on. And then to come back to catch up from three weeks and then have another four weeks of uh, filming basically every single day, working full time during the day, having events, dates, a camera crew follow you around when you do everything uh, in the evening. And then on the weekends, we would be filming most weekends in that time as well. So there was, there was, um, not a lot of downtime. I was incredibly busy at work, uh, learning a new role that I had never done before, uh, managing a team of 12 people that I had I've never managed more than four. And so that, on top of constantly being in front of cameras and trying to decide, you know, w what I should say when it's time to decide if I'm going to get married or not. And little fun fact, I'm also introverted. So the fact that I had no <laughs> downtime to recharge whatsoever, I was burning out at a rate that I can't even, I don't even know if I've recovered yet, to be completely honest. I still get those feelings of like, oh my God, like, is it ever going to slow down? Uh, mm. Am I ever going to breathe? So I would say those two things, just the, the job and then like the, the managing regular life and having cameras in front of you the whole time. What is it? What is a telltale sign that that Nick is is getting burnt out? It's for me. There's internal signs that I don't think anyone else knows about unless I I share it, and that's <clears throat> brain fog. That's forgetting things. Um, you know, I'm very organized. I'm very procedural. Like I feel like if I put process in place and auto, I call it automating my life, then I don't need to to spend time thinking about the things that don't really matter. So that means always putting my wallet in the same place, my key in the same place. So I have this mm. routine of I'm going to grab this and I'm going to leave. So I don't forget my wallet. I don't leave my keys, um, things like that. And so I think when I start m losing track of those procedurals or routines, that's a sign that maybe someone else would notice. Do you ever experience burnout? I mean, I, I you're hosting events and, you know, we'll get into that and, and stuff too. But, um, you know, talk, and, talk about you. 2015, you were living the life. You were working in theater, making money, traveling. You commented earlier um, on perspective and, you know, your friends and family would be calling to congratulate you on all your success. But um, how are you actually feeling? Thank you for asking. And first of all, thank you for sharing that with your listeners. You know, I know that this podcast is an extension of you being so curious about others and wanting to serve and share other people's stories and help people empathize with the guests that you bring on. But the vulnerability that you just brought to this conversation is one of the greatest testaments to your leadership ability. You're, you're, you're a man you. of and for the people, and, and you lead with your heart which invites your guests and those around you to participate. So thank you for that. It must be a pretty neat thing that. to be on your team at work. Um, look, Nick, you, I mean, you, you went right to the source. Um, there have been many points in my life where on the outside, on paper, it looks like I got everything I'd ever want in the world. Nice job, nice family, nice partner, nice friends nice accolades, whatever the thing is, doesn't mean that you feel good in the heart. doesn't mean that you feel good on the inside. So just because your life looks good on paper doesn't mean it feels good in the heart, folks. I want you to acknowledge that disconnect. My biggest, or I should say my original disconnect that 
started this whole journey in the last seven years was in July of 2015. I had just come back from producing a, a Broadway play in Rome, Italy, and I was just living large and having a good time. But, you know, Italy really changed my perspective on a lot of things. They loved, they honored history. They drank and ate amongst friends and community. They walking through the streets of Trastevere and catching the sunsets on Ponte Umberto was really la dolce vita. They were... They were slowing down. They were living the good life. It was very intoxicating. And when I came back to New York City, I realized, shit, I am emotionally impotent. Yeah, everything looks good. Yeah. But I feel like a fraud on the inside. Lonely, unfulfilled, disconnected, insecure, nervous, cautious, anxious, overwhelmed. A lot of bad, bad, bad feelings. And the last time I would kind of felt all those things at once was in my early 20s. Led me down a deep, dark path of non-suicidal self-injury, jail, rehab, depression, all these kind of things. And I didn't want to go back. So I thought, what was it about Italy that changed my perspective on everything? Well, it's how they ate. Specifically, it's how they ate amongst mm -hmm. community. So back home in my kitchen here in New York City, I said, I got to do something to you know, recreate that magic here in New York. And I started inventing stuff in my kitchen right accidentally created a pasta sauce recipe <laughs> it sounds laughable i don't think you can accidentally create a pasta sauce recipe you know what i'll say i accidentally got really good at cooking pasta really quick which uh was not in my life plan but <laughs> uh figured i should probably feed it to people to see if it was good or not and decided to host a dinner party July 15th, 2015, I invited 15 of my friends over for dinner. 6.30 p.m. cocktails began. 8 p.m. dinner was served. But at 7.47 p.m., we put the pasta in the pot, delegated 11 specific tasks to get all the attendees to work together to create the meal, and we sat down for dinner at 8. Why 7.47? Because it took pasta 13 minutes to cook, and I wanted a few minutes, and blah, blah, blah. So we ate together. We drank together. And then we had some meaningful, meaningful conversations together. See, Nick, at that very first dinner, we asked a simple question. If you could give credit or thanks to one person in your life that you don't give enough credit or thanks to, that you've never thought to thank, who would that be? And we saw people come up with the most amazing stories. If you're watching this, I want you to ponder that question for a sec. I'll repeat it. If you could give credit or thanks to one person in your life that you don't give enough credit or thanks to, that you've never thought to thank, who would that be? Think about them. Are they from recent? Are they from a long time ago? Are they living? Have they passed away? Do they have a positive impact? Do they have a negative impact? Are you still in touch with them? Have you lost touch with them? Do they know their impact? Have you ever told them their impact? What's their legacy? And people, Nick, came up with the most amazing conversations, right? We weren't asking them what they were grateful for. Yeah. We were saying, who have you never thought to thank? And the immediate emotional impulse was, Shit. It's a tough question, and it's a different perspective than you would usually come to that yeah. answer. People would say everything from their third grade teacher that drove them to soccer practice after school, their grandpa that bought them their first keyboard, their wife sitting next to them that they've never thanked their mom, whatever. On the flip side, they thanked that mean ex-boss that ridiculed mm. them, that fired them, that told them they would never amount to anything. And look at them now. They thanked that mean ex-girlfriend that broke up with them and made them realize they were gay. <laughs> they thank that high school bully that made them get into whatever. See, ultimately, 
the theory is, in our world, to be grateful is to be grateful to someone. Mm -hmm. I'm not of the belief that you can give gratitude to the sun. I'm not of the belief that you can give gratitude to your health or give gratitude to this good food. No. If you want to be grateful to the sun, be grateful to Bob for scheduling your 2 p.m. meeting outside under the sun. Don't be grateful to your health. Be grateful right. to TJ who taught you how to meditate and Sarah who taught you how to lift right. weights. I don't know. Right? I love that. So the dinner table gave them an opportunity to share some amazing heartfelt stories. And we found that people connected in the most meaningful ways around that dinner table. I mean, everybody this cried. Wasn't planned, right? This wasn't no. planned. This was something it that was you just, just got people together. It just happened. But you know what, Nick? It made me feel less alone. Mm -hmm. It made everybody at the dinner table feel less alone. And we haven't stopped since. I quit my career in theater. I dedicated life, my life, to the, to the dinner table, to traveling all over the world, doing these, these great dinners and serving these great people and doing them for companies and doing all this thing. And then, and then, and then COVID hit. You remember that part of my story. Oh, yeah. I do. I do. You were just starting to uh, produce these experiences, I think you call them, right? The gratitude experience. You were rolling. Your first book was about to come out. Pandemic hits. Everybody Fuck. in the world goes back home. How did that impact you, both Fuck. personally, your business? Great question, Nick. You know, here's the crazy thing. Leading up to my first book launch in on April 7th, 2020, you all know that date. That's like the beginning of the pandemic. Leading up to it, I grabbed my book, the first book, and I grabbed my dad, and we sailed off to Europe. I wanted to show Italy what she meant to me, what she inspired in me. We came back with all this inspired energy and bellies full of carbonara and sunsets on Ponte Umberto and dinners at Dienzo and Cafe San Eustachio. And then the world shut down. Mm. I said, no, no. All revenue went to zero. Book tour canceled. Corporate events off the wazoo. And I'm sitting there for the second time and five years at the time, lonely, unfulfilled, disconnected, insecure. Yeah, I got into doing sourdough like all the people were doing, nice. and I grew a garden, and I spent every day with my girlfriend, but I was like, I cavolt. What is life without my dinner table? Yeah. What is life without these principles of gratitude? What is life without my pasta sauce? Who am I? I'm nobody. Right. And then you know what? I realized there might be other people that feel a similar type of way. See, I, in the beginning days of the pandemic, turned into an entitled piece of shit. Okay. I believed that my trauma was bigger than everybody else's trauma because yeah. I had this big book launch that got canceled. You know what? That's a form of entitlement. That's victim mindset. I thought my shit stunk bigger than your shit, and therefore I deserve pity. But then I realized, right. my God, everybody else is feeling lonely, unfulfilled, disconnected, insecure, nervous, cautious, anxious, overwhelmed. I should bring the principles of gratitude back to the people. And we started hosting virtual gratitude experiences. Yeah. They started off slow, but then eventually, every single night for the first couple months of the pandemic, 50 to 100 people were coming for virtual gratitude experience every night. And boom, there we were again. We realized we didn't need the dinner table. We no. didn't need the pasta sauce. We had gratitude on our side. And boy, was it fun. We hired a few new people. We started learning the science and psychology to back up everything we knew and were doing intuitively for so many years. Right. And then the company started calling again and saying, you know what, Chris? Our employees are miserable. They're disconnected. They're isolated. They're overwhelmed. They're insecure. We need these experiences. Come do them for us. And Nick, we've had a good time ever since, right? 
We regrew the company. We regrew the experience. We served tens of thousands of people ever since the start of the pandemic. And life was flying high. We were never having to travel again. We were turning on the computer. And all of a sudden, what happened next? What did happen next? I got too full of myself. Yeah. When you say too full of yourself, elaborate what you mean by that. Because it sounds, the, the thing that's so fascinating from what I know about you and what I'm learning now is it's very human to have ups and downs. It's very ups human to feel confident one day, not confident the next day. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to grow your ego in a space and then not have it in another space. And I think that's a very relatable thing and trend that I'm noticing with you. So I'm very curious at what mm -hmm. point would you say I was full of myself? Cause you know, a little bit of the, at the beginning, woe is me, my book tour got canceled up and then figure it out and you're up again. And now you're up maybe a little too high for, for your own well being. Talk, talk so, us through that. So on paper, one would have seen rapid expansion, co-founding a couple new companies in different territories. Everybody sell, saying we, we should scale. Everybody sending us leads. Everybody giving us accolades, uh, you know, uh, accomplishments and accolades and positive reviews every single day. But at 4.30 p.m. on Thursday, December 30th, 2021, I got on an hour-long call with one of my clients and dear friends, Lisa Penn from SAP. And 30 minutes into the call, she looked at me and she said, Chris, you look like shit. I said, what? She said, yeah, you look, you look beat up, man. Do you want to end this call early so you can just go take a rest? Oh, man. Everything was coming at me at once. Executive were coaches were giving me the, the, the things to scale. People were sending me leads in the dozen. People were saying, do this and do that and do this. And at 4.30 p.m., Lisa said, go take a nap. Yeah. Well, later that night, I went out to dinner with my girlfriend, Molly. Mm -hmm. We had just bought a home. She had just got a new job. She was leaving the next day to go home to see her family. And we went out to Lure Fish Bar in Soho, and the drinks started flowing. Everybody in the bar was buying us drinks. They had heard that we were there to celebrate, and all, all of a good time was occurring. And I said, I said a couple things. Made us have an argument. Mm -hmm. We got home. I felt like a complete piece of crap. I took out a kitchen knife, and I went straight to my arm. Oh, my gosh. I engaged, and I know this is triggering for some people to, to hear, but yeah. I engaged in my most recent and largest episode of non-suicidal self-injury. I do not have suicidal ideation. But what I wanted to feel in that moment was pain. It was me crying out, crumbling under the pressure of what was going on around me. Nick, you talked about burnout in the moments yeah. leading up to the show and, and surrounding the show and saying you, you've not even really gotten over it. I know how that feels, my man. And in that moment, a kitchen knife was my, the only way that I could feel pain. The unfortunate part of the instance, the incident is I flew a little bit too close to the sun. Yeah. And I almost didn't make it out. But what happened was, my girlfriend flew out at 6 a.m. the next day to go home to Detroit to see her family. And it left me alone in my apartment, collecting my thoughts and listening to my feelings. I just, I would walk around my apartment all day crying. I'd look at a lemon and I'd cry. I'd watch a Nancy Myers movie and I'd cry. I would see Sean and Leslie. I would see Alec and Sean. I got on the phone with Scott and Scott said, dude, the problem is obvious. You just got so many things going on that you couldn't see the clearing through the forest. You just, you're crumbling under all the stuff. And I said, holy crap. He's right. Yeah. I got so much good in my life, and I appreciated none of it, Nick. 
You I lost fell your victim. Gratitude. I lost my dude. That's it. Yeah. I fell victim to the biggest thing in the history of the world that's caused this kind of malevolent behavior. Ingratitude. Mm. Now, of course, that's my own personal opinion, but you can go back to some of these books 2,000 years ago, Nick, yeah. reading the words of Marcus Aurelius, Lucius Annius Seneca, Aristotle. In the year 63 AD, Lucius Annius Seneca, who was known as Seneca the Elder, mm -hmm. wrote a book called On Benefits. And in that book, he states that the greatest plague to Roman society is that we neither know how to give nor receive a benefit of all the vices co common in today's society. Right. Nothing is more common than ingratitude. He says ingratitude has caused the worst in humanity. Thievery, tyrants, adultery, lying, cheating, stealing, whatever right. is due to the ungrateful man. And... Here's the simple way of describing ingratitude. First, gratitude. You can either wake up and appreciate, overwhelmingly appreciate the good you have in your life and help it go that way. And yeah, maybe focus on fixing a few of the things that need fixing, but overwhelming appreciation, that's gratitude. Or you could wake up every day and focus on trying to fix the things, the couple things that are broken, and maybe appreciate a couple of the things and help a few things go right. right. That's ingratitude. That is just a matter of perspective. Mm -hmm. That's it. And I fell victim to ingratitude at a period of time where everything on paper looked like I had everything in the world. For the second time, too. Because you have described yep. before, from the outside perspective, yep. everything on paper, theater, traveling, friends, everything looked great, family congratulating you, and you fell victim again. What? How did you pull yourself out of the rut this time? That was six months ago, seven months ago. That was, and, yeah, Thursday, December 30th, yeah. 2021. You know what? Just like you, I'm not out of the rut. I'm not. But you know what I've done? At least, step one, I've found the positive benefits in my non-suicidal self-injury episode. Now, here's the thing about gratitude. As I mentioned, I don't believe in the whole, I'm grateful for the sunshine, I'm grateful for the good, right? There's a, there's a term, it's called grateful processing. It's when you think about a negative autobiographical experience from your past, you write about it or talk it out, which destigmatizes the negative emotion. It organizes that traumatic, unprocessed experience, and you get to find the positive benefits in it. Right. We found... And, and, and then through a bunch of research, invented a formula. So it's in the book, Positive Benefits Checklist. I looked at my non-suicidal self-injury episode. First of all, like one of the biggest things that I was like stuck with in Q4 2021 was what's my book about? What's the introduction? What's, why would anybody even read it? And then I had the non-suicidal self-injury episode. It gave me a vision. It gave me the purpose. It gave me the intro. It gave me the meat of my book. Right. All in literally a 30-page excerpt. It gave the whole... So it got me unstuck. Okay. So the question is, did my non-suicidal self-injury episode teach me empathy? Yes. Did it teach me acceptance? Yes. Did it teach me appreciation, gratitude? Yes. Did it bring my family closer together? Yes. Did it give me community closeness? Yes. I have support groups I can reach out to. My I own community that. reached out in support. Did it give me faith in people? Yes. Did it teach me compassion? Yes. Did it give me material gain? 
Yes. Me communicating my vulnerable story with people yes. through a podcast, through a book, at my keynotes, at my virtual gratitude experiences has led to an increase in revenue. We had our most profitable month ever in the month following wow. my non-suicidal self-entry. Did it give me a positive self-view? Yes, yeah. finally. Did it make me have a little bit of a lifestyle change? Work less, appreciate things more? Yes. Did it give me self-confidence, self-efficacy? Yes. I got to say yes for 11 out of the 11 things on my wow. positive benefits checklist, which means my non-suicidal self-injury episode was one of the greatest things to ever happen to me, Nick. And that is perspective, right? That is you finding the perspective and yep. benefits from going through the challenges and the ruts and having those ups and downs. And I think that's something that's incredibly relatable and incredibly powerful to hear you talk about. Am I cured? No. Have I solved my pain? No. But at least I found the positive benefits and I can own my story. Mm -hmm. See, Nick, life is not about wishing your life to be perfect. I'm going to be honest with you people. The self-help industry has fed you bullshit for 40 years. <laughs> you cannot wish away your pain. You cannot clear your limiting beliefs. You cannot manifest your destiny. Yeah. You cannot hope that everything is going to be perfect. I'm sorry. That's just not real. Yeah. That's made up like 40 years ago. Yeah. Life is a form of suffering. Shitty things are going to occur. How you decide to process them is up to you. If you're trying to seek massive life change starting today, don't upend your life. Just change your perspective of it. Right. You can't all quit your nine to five to pursue a life of passion. You can't all wish to be cured of that incurable disease. Right. But if you can find some positive benefits in it and you can make it part of your story, you can use that as an opportunity to connect with other people who have a similar shared emotion. Nick and I communicated that we both have felt burnout and imposter and overwhelm yeah. and introversion, fear and scarcity and blah, blah, blah. That's brought us closer. Not the things that we achieve when the world is good, but it's how we support each other when times are bad. That's yeah. the opportunity you have. I love that. And I completely agree. And I'm a work in progress. I think everyone's a work in progress. The things that I say, or that you say, we're not out there, or you're not, I'm, I'm, you know, I don't have the same, uh, obviously same experience as you have, but I know like what I need to do. I know how a relationship should work. Friendship should work. Relationships with families, boundaries, all of those things. But just because you know, doesn't mean you can always do it. Boy. And that, that is the, the thing. And one of the things that has really surprised me coming out of the show is when I get a message from someone that's like, you're so patient, you're so this, you're so that, how do you get to that point? And I'm like, I'm patient in certain situations and not in others. I'm you know, frustrated in certain situations and not others. And I think that understanding that people even if you're a motivational speaker or you're leading a gratitude experience, that doesn't mean that that's who you are all the time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the important thing that I would love for people to take out of this conversation is that you have ups and downs. Everyone has ups and downs. You hit a very low point and you're, you turn that into something positive for yourself to hit your 11 point checklist. And now you're even, comfortable enough to say, I'm not perfect. I'm not back. I'm not healed. That's a work that you're a work in progress. That's going to continue. And I hope everyone who listens to this can understand that you're never finished. You're always a work in progress. Oh. Yeah. The minute that you feel like you've accomplished what you need accomplished or learned what you need to learn or process what you need to process, you're done. Yeah. Then you go into that entitlement mindset. Yeah. Then you go into that ego. Then you pretend like you know everything, that your life is perfect, like your shit doesn't stink. And then yeah. you look and appear to look like you are superior to others who still have a journey to process. That yeah. is in itself a form of entitlement. And yeah. and that is the worst 
I mean, that's the worst thing that can happen, uh, you know, to a person is to, you know, to pretend like they don't need help from others, right? In yeah, ingratitude, okay. ingratitude is walking around thinking that you can do it yourself. You don't need help from others. You haven't received help from others, that you are this perfect individual. Yeah. Gratitude is adopting a posture of otherness. It's yeah. adopting a posture of humility. Keep in mind, humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking about yourself less. If right. you can think about others and acknowledge the benefits you've received and how much more you have to learn from others, you will forever maintain a humble mindset which will make you more approachable. It'll make people want to be around you more and it'll create your journey of being a lifelong learner. Which we all should aspire to be. Being a question asker, assuming you don't know nothing, but still have a confident humility, as my friend Kat Cole says. You got to have self-confidence and humility in the same breath. It's 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 a delicate balance, but you need a bit of both. Yeah, I think that's well said. And it is a delicate balance because being confident doesn't always mean you know everything. And sometimes yeah. people per, people's perception is someone who's confident, it has an ego in some cases, is unapproachable to your point earlier. And in reality, it's just it's just a skill you have to learn. I mean, I had to learn it. I I have to tell you, like starting up this podcast and putting myself out there and asking people to be vulnerable with me. It's tough and I'm doing it to learn myself because, you know, I've, I've had my own mental health challenges. I've never, I grew up, you didn't really talk about it and I didn't know what anxiety was until I had a friend in high school that I met that explained what it was and how she was suffering from it. And that's because, you know, you, you didn't talk about it. And now we have people like you that can come out and be vulnerable and show that, you know, when you have these types of challenges, you can still maintain a normal quote yeah. life. And, yeah. you know, I, I feel like I personally have done a lot of work to be able to be confident, but to start this podcast and even reach out to people to be guests, <laughs> it was a process because I'm like, do people really care to talk to me? Like, am, am I really good enough to do this? Is this something I should be spending my time on? And if I get on this recording, I thought to myself, I'm like, Chris seems like he's a, you know, he's a, he's a really put together guy. And then I read your, your, uh, excerpt from your book that you shared. And I was like, oh no, I can talk to him. Like he's, he's a normal guy. And so again, it's like removing these stigmas and these perceptions that we have, I think can, can help us, uh, do really good things as a Mm. society and individuals. It, thank you for being so brave and acknowledging these anxieties, right? You you are at the, the beginning of your artist journey. Yeah. And the gift that you have to share with the world will be a great source of anxiety as you are getting started. But you must always know that the, the, the joy and the wisdom that this podcast is bringing to others has a greater net positive effect on humanity than the negative impact of your anxiety on you. Yeah. And that's what we I must always that. remember. That's a good thing to know, and I appreciate you saying that. I'm going to remember that uh, one. <laughs> <laughs> I just made it. I just made it up, which uh, I, I, I probably need to research it before I really, before you really quote. You know, it's you know, it, it's it's interesting. The this this podcast, uh, the medium, um, you know, me being on and you being the interviewer, or me being an interviewer and you being on, we are mm-hmm. both learning things about our subconscious by answering or asking questions in the moment, right? The things that people see that are like the packaged, prepared goods of us, that's like the public facing side of us. Yeah. Um, But when you're like in the moment talking about brave conversations, you get to tap into like the subconscious version of you and like it just comes out. It's so true. And And that's when you truly get to know yourself. Yeah. Right. When you put yourself in vulnerable positions, that's when you truly get to know yourself. You know, for all the people who are, you know, sitting here and, and, and watching this, the people that would show up to those early dinner parties 
in my, at the time, 350-square-foot studio apartment in the middle of New York City. <laughs> you know, they exhibited tremendous bravery because they knew that they were stepping into that room to learn something about themselves. Because I was going to create the space in order to facilitate that. And so the people arriving to my dinner parties probably had more anxiety than me hosting the party. <laughs> when you asked the question earlier at the beginning, I was like thinking to myself, oh my God, who would I say? Who should I say? What am I, who am I grateful for? And, and it's funny because I can imagine like being a table full of people and everyone having that anxiety and you kind of being able to, to read that room and, and sense that. <laughs> you know what? It's, um, and I want to hear who your person is in a sec, but you know, one of the, one of the great things, um, one of the great things that happens when you're in a room full of strangers around a dinner table is that it, it gives you permission to share something vulnerable. See, this would have been a different conversation if you and I had known each other intimately oh, yeah. for years. We probably wouldn't have gone to the depths we've gone today. But because we're relative strangers, uh, just mm -hmm. beginning hopefully a beautiful friendship, but because <laughs> we're strangers, we were able to get vulnerable without the fear of the, the right. intimacy of the connection. Stanford University actually did a 44-page sociological study about this called The Strength of Weak Ties, where they found wow. that vital information is best passed through a social network through some kind of weak tie. So when you look at a, 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 a dinner table, everybody there is a weak or dormant or non-existent tie. You know, you're not coming and, and telling a vulnerable story next to your mom. You know, you're not coming and telling a vulnerable story about, you know, the, the time you came out gay, but like your older brother who doesn't even know you're gay is sitting right there. Right. right. Telling it to a room true. full of strangers, which then gives you a little bit of self-confidence of knowing nobody threw a tomato at me when I talked about that. Maybe <laughs> I can actually talk about this tomorrow to people I actually know. Very true. That's a great point. I, I have to look into that study because I... I find that very fascinating and it makes you makes you think about like the the social not really social structures but the the social ways we communicate and takes you even to you know there's a lot of trolls online that you know have zero Gosh. photos follow a thousand people and zero followers and it's interesting because like they say things in a similar sense where I feel like they're saying things that are projecting something that's inside them that they can't say oh, with course. their normal face on. So they use these as like yeah. a disguise or a, a, a guise to go out and say things that they can't say to their own social network. And Dude. that is such a, for positive and negative reasons, that's such a fascinating like study, and I guess. Anonymity ruins integrity, but anonymity also gives permission to be vulnerable. Right. So both sides of the coin, right? Yeah. You, you can say anything you want to be hurtful to others if your identity isn't attached to those words. Right. But you can also be vulnerable and connective and supportive if your identity isn't attached with that vulnerability because most people think of vulnerability as a weakness. Right. They think if I'm vulnerable, people will abuse me. Right. When in reality, vulnerability creates lasting emotional connection. Um, especially right. when you, you know, you're vulnerable about the, the meaningful stuff that others can relate to. Exactly. And I think that's a really, really true testament to this conversation. Um, you know, I could go on and on and on about being vulnerable with one another. But, um, you know, I wanted to, I had two more things I really wanted to ask you about. Uh, totally. one is I have ups and downs. You have ups and downs. We've talked about that. We have a lot of people listening to this, hopefully. And when they're down, like, do you have any advice of, of where to start when you're having that down? Turn to gratitude. I hate to be so kitschy when I say this, but let me paint a picture of what I've seen and it'll answer why I'm telling this gratitude thing. In 2020 and 2021, and in 2022, 
a lot of people came through our virtual gratitude experiences. And we would, at minute six, we would ask, you know, the people, you know, whether it was a group of 200 or a group of 20, we'd ask the people, what's one word that honestly describes how you feel right now in the moment? Mm -hmm. Most people started our virtual gratitude experiences feeling pretty negative. I bet. Like when you actually ask people how they're doing, people are kind of miserable and that's all right. That's what humanizes us. Mm -hmm. You know, we'd invite people into their first round of breakout groups and, you know, either someone with a positive starting emotion would meet someone with another positive starting emotion. That positive energy was contagious and it'd be an amazing breakout group yeah. or someone with a negative emotion would meet someone with another negative emotion and they'd realize they weren't alone mm -hmm. and it'd create connection and understanding. And that was beautiful. Right. So then we'd go through the experience and we'd do more things and we'd ask them this signature gratitude question. You know, we'd throw them out into more breakout groups and they'd be in groups of three and they'd be answering this signature gratitude question. If you could give credit or thanks to one person in your life that you don't give enough credit or thanks to, who would that be? And then we'd come back from the breakout groups by about minute 59 and we'd ask a simple question. What's one word that honestly describes how you feel now? Put that word in the group chat. Grateful, connected, happy, joy, optimistic, wiser, lighter, inspired, motivated, connected. 99.998% of our attendees go from miserable to positive in 59 minutes by answering that gratitude question. That's not an accident. Marty Seligman, who's the founder of the positive psychology movement, literally did a study with hundreds of people where he tested the impact that different positive psychology micro interventions would have on the people. Mm -hmm. uh, an empathy intervention, a, a this intervention, a, a, a writing in a journal intervention. The intervention that the literally the group, all they did, was write a gratitude letter to someone, that so positive psychology micro-intervention had the greatest long-lasting impact after the micro-intervention by far. See, what people don't realize is that gratitude feels good to give, it feels good to receive, mm -hmm. and it feels good just to witness other people doing within small group format. If you get four of your friends together over a piece of pizza, and you ask them this gratitude question, and you give everybody five minutes to going around doing this, yeah. your life will change. And I'm going to quote Maya Angelou when I say this. Maya Angelou, a great poet, activist, artist, mm -hmm. Nobel laureate, once said, people won't remember what you did. People won't remember how you, uh, what you said but they'll always remember how you made them feel. And never before in human history do people need your help, if you're watching, your help to make them feel seen and heard and understood. And if you go out and practice gratitude with someone, you're going to be there for them in the most magical way humanly possible. Guaranteed. That's Guaranteed. Yeah. And that's a positive, simple impact that you can have on your life and then start having a positive and, effect on others. And, and by the way, I must say, and this might be the only tweetable moment of our call, <laughs> not all gratitude given is gratitude heard. Yep. So think about this. If you've thought of someone that you need to give gratitude to, you need to think about how they might best receive it. Yes. It's like love now, languages. Gary Chapman, yeah. the five love languages. What are those five love languages, Nick? Uh, physical touch, uh, words of affirmation, um, quality time. What are the Acts other two? Acts of service. Acts of service. Gifts. Gift, gift giving. That's the five. So, so physical touch, words of affirmation, quality time, gifts, physical touch. Or acts of service. I forget acts which ones I said. But anyways, we know them. Gary Chapman's The Five Love Languages. Nick, what would happen 
if you know that I love quality time and acts of service, but all you do is send me an Amazon gift card. Chris, this is what, what I've happened? been preaching to people since I read the love languages is that it's not just how you receive love. It's how you give love. And then it's also how your partner, your family, your friends, your coworkers, your entire network that you balance how you show yep. love with how they receive love. And it's also on that person to do the same thing. So if I'm a gift giver or acts of service, but they receive love through physical touch, they need to also have the wherewithal to recognize that when I give a gift, that's also me showing love. Yeah. And then I have to realize I also have to be more physical in my, my touch. And it's a, yeah. it's a balance. It isn't as it's easy as knowing your love language and boom, you're done. It's, it, as I said, gratitude, not all gratitude given is gratitude heard. You must think about, and, and we talk about that in our new book, but one of the things that we talk about with gratitude is to make it inconvenient for the giver. We have mm -hmm. something called the benefit appraisal that if you're going to go out and give gratitude, it must mean something to the receiver. Like it don't go give gratitude in a way that like means nothing to them. Right. Um, it, it, it must have cost you some sort of time or energy or effort or money. Like, it, you know, if you're a billionaire, don't just spend a hundred dollars giving a gift to someone. That's like not, <laughs> that's like meaningless for you. Yeah. Uh, but if you're someone who has a really busy schedule, a person's going to like value if you take two hours out of your busy schedule and you ride your bike across town yeah. to go have lunch with them. You don't even have to pay for the lunch, yeah. but you've made it very inconvenient for you, which makes it very meaningful to have wanted to give. You have to like generally want to have given that gratitude. It cannot I be agree. obligatory. Gratitude should not come as a form of social reciprocity. Hey, Nick, me had, Nick had me on his podcast. Therefore, I'm going to send him a thank you note. No, it's like <laughs> Nick had me on his podcast. He made me really think about a few things. I'm very grateful that he gave me a platform to share my message because I get to see the comments that you have put in the comments below sharing how much today's episode meant to you. Right. That just brightened my day. My God. Me too. Thank you. I'm crying watching these things and Nick gave me that opportunity. Nick gave me that feeling, that authentic feeling that was of value, of great benefit to me and I'd like to thank him for that. I could either give it back or I could pay it forward in his honor, right? Imagine if you're trying to give gratitude. Like if you're thinking right now, Chris, I just listened to you ask that question 10 minutes ago, yeah. but I've never thought to thank my grandpa, but he passed away a few years ago. Mm -hmm. What am I supposed to do with that? You can't give that gratitude back, but you can pay it forward in their honor. And let this love that. be the I moment that. that you think about that. Let me tell you a story of what happened three weeks ago surrounding the Yule Vade shooting mm -hmm. in Texas. The shooting happened, I believe, on a Tuesday. What a great American tragedy. The next day, Wednesday, I was producing a whole day's worth of keynotes and experiences for the United States Department of Commerce. Oh, and we gosh. had... This, this virtual gratitude experience where a whole bunch of the HR ladies from the Department of Commerce came. And we did the breakout groups. We did the things. We asked them the gratitude question. They came back, and I called on someone, person A. I said, hey, uh, Sarah, whatever her name was, you know, what came up in your breakout group? She said, well, everybody in my breakout group gave credit and thanks to someone from their childhood. And I asked her, does everybody in the group have the opportunity to go back and thank that person from their childhood? She started mm -hmm. tearing up. She said, unfortunately, I gave gratitude to my grandfather who's long passed on. I don't have the, the opportunity to go back and thank him. So I asked another person on the call, Francis, hey, Francis, what should Sarah do with that energy? She started tearing up. She said, well, in my breakout group, I gave credit and thanks to my son 
who passed away when he was a kid. And I can't go back and thank him, but here's how we've kept his legacy alive. Planted trees, started a foundation, give out the, the Live Strong bracelets, do all those things. Yeah. And I saw another person tearing up in the call, Jane. I said, Jane, what's coming up for you right now? She said, my daughter passed away a few months ago, and next week she turns 14. And I've spent the last few months thinking about how I don't have the opportunity to go back and thank her. Yeah. But as of now, I have the opportunity to keep her legacy alive and pay that gratitude for it. And I looked into the group chat, and I saw so many people commenting, saying they had lost a child as well. Folks, gratitude is not supposed to be easy. Bumps. Yeah. It, because gratitude you, you is not supposed – What's coming up for you, Nick? Tell me about those goosebumps. Tell me about oh, those eyes right no, now. No, I was just saying that the goosebumps of realizing, oh, my gosh, she can take the legacy of her daughter and pay it forward. Like – coming full circle it's it's a beautiful perspective change nick you're getting emotional right now what's coming up for you bud uh just uh, you know i feel for I, I can't imagine um you know having people talking about loss like that it's just it's tough you know it's just it sucks for people who go through that yeah there's never supposed to be an easy conversation that that surrounds this in our book, we tell a story of my friend Susan Ganeshan turning grief into legacy. Mm -hmm. And we, we tell the story of you know, some of the things that you, you can do to process it. And one of the things that you can do immediately is find gratitude. Yeah. Find gratitude for the moments you did have with them. Yeah. Find gratitude for the impact they've had in your life and the stories that you'll keep alive in their honor. And if we can do that, we can create a generative, we can create a life that's bigger than our resume, Yeah. right? If we can start now, and by the way, you know, and I'm not the best at this, but one of the downsides or the downfalls of doing this work, I mean, you talked about earlier about oftentimes it's the happiness guru who's like the most miserable person in the world. <laughs> exactly. Like, you know, you, you look at a guy who's built a business around this, but I'm the least grateful person in the world. I've built my life so well about giving gratitude to others that I forgot about giving gratitude to myself in the process. It's so important to know that. The first, one of the first per people that I messaged after my non-suicidal self-injury was my friend Grace Smith, who's one of the world's leading hypnotherapists, Wall Street Journal bestselling author, built a big business around hypnotiz uh, hip hypnotherapy. And I messaged her and, and, and Brooke and Savannah on her team and said, I need you now more than ever. Help me. And she, they immediately came in and we did a number of sessions just talking about cultivating self-compassion. Those kids in Yulve, these kids on the call with the Department of Commerce, they didn't have the opportunity to define their legacy. And I want this to be the moment, the realization that, that you need to take action right now. Years from now, as we've long passed on, what will people say about you? Ponder for a sec. What is the impact you'd like to have in the world around you? What is the gratitude you'd like to give yourself? If we can take that intention into the life that we live going forward, we can start to create a generative legacy. Now, I'm not of the belief that everybody's got to go out and have some epic life of impact and change the world and do these things and quit the 9 to 5 and pursue a life of passion. No. My dear friend Jess once said, you may not be able to change the whole world, but as long as you've changed one person's whole world, yeah. you've done enough. Let that be your, your inspired action, folks. Go out and give that gratitude to one person. See, most people don't give gratitude because we assume it won't have a positive impact on the recipient. But studies show that that impact is immeasurable in a meaningful way. Go out and give that gratitude before it's too late. I love you know, that. I got to share, I got to share my message of non-suicidal self-injury and I got to put it into a video and broadcast it to our community. And I don't have a, as big of a community as, as Nick or, or Charlie have, but, uh, you know, I, I got to share it to my, my small community. My own cousin texted me and said, last night I heard the gunshot of my neighbor's son 
committing suicide in his backyard. I wish I could have shown him this video yesterday. He would have known that he's not alone. Now, folks, you have that responsibility for our planet. You have that opportunity for our world. Go out and use gratitude as a tool to not only save yourself, but save the lives of others and let them know how much they mean to you before it's yeah. too late. We must act now. I completely agree with you. And I'm going to commit right here on this call that I'm going to show gratitude today uh, to at least one person. And I'm going to try and make that a it's all habit. Takes every single day to show gratitude to one person. Um, this has been an, an amazing conversation. And again, Chris, I've said it a few times. Thank you for your vulnerability. Um, you've, you've created a space where I feel comfortable sharing things that I may not have planned to. And I'm hoping uh, uh, area for this community here to communicate with one another, communicate with us, communicate with their friends and family and show gratitude. I have one, one question for you, um, and then I'll give the floor to you if you have anything you want to ask <laughs> me. But um, I got to ask you if you could give gratitude to one person in your life today in this moment, or maybe you can commit you'll do that today too, uh, who is it going to be and what's it for? A name that pops up is my friend Andrew Brennan. He, so many years ago, when we were just having our dinner parties, he, um, we just, it was like inviting people for dinner. There was nothing like official to it. Mm -hmm. And one day he, he, and I think we called him like dinner with friends or something. That was just our little, like tiny little movement we were doing. And he came in and he said, Chris, uh, this thing needs a name. And I think you should brand the time of night that the whole, everything changes. You should call it the 747 Club. And he gave us the idea that we could be something far bigger than what we were originally just dreaming up around the dinner table. And those numbers, that word, it's become a brand, a company, a time that saved my life. My greatest Achilles heel. My greatest inspiration has become a tattoo on my arms from Gnarly Gav and so much more. Yeah. And I, I don't think I thank him enough. And he, he's had, a, he's had a, a, a hard journey up and down. And uh, I think he, he deserves gratitude. And I'm going to reach out. And I think he just moved back to New York City. So I'm going to reach out and, and thank him that. for that. Thank you for sharing that. I love that. That's amazing. Everyone you, listening bud. should do that exercise, answer yeah. that question and do something nice. Show gratitude to someone who's changed your life or impacted you. Hey, Alexander Hamilton. He's done some pretty good things for my life too. <laughs> Gives <laughs> you talk about, come on, talk about what you asked in the lightning round. That's the dude. <laughs> That's the dude. I mean, normally, normally I, uh, normally I just keep, uh, normally in that corner, I just keep, uh, a, a, a photo of my girlfriend's feet. In the oh, corner, nice. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> for the book launch week, I decided to replace it with Alexander Hamilton. He's so an inspiration. Mo Molly, Molly's legs not. went into the corner <laughs> behind Alexander Hamilton this week. <laughs> Great. Oh man! All right, I'm Chris. Get in well, trouble for that one. <laughs> <laughs> showing the feet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh there shit anything... there's all the the foot people on the internet that are bro oh no uh, we, we sorry molly <laughs> no i'm we kidding <laughs> uh, is there is there anything that you want to ask me i like to give uh guests an opportunity to ask me anything are you kidding i've got a million questions nick <laughs> and i'm not gonna do that here today but i um no i can't you're just gonna have to come on my podcast Oh, well, we'll have to make that happen. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's, uh, you know, it gets intense. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I uh, no, I, I, I just, my question to you in closing would be, Nick, do you understand the impact that you could potentially have on people by having these brave conversations? Do you um, understand it? I know I have the vision to understand it and to impact people um, individually because I hate stigmas. I think we should eliminate 
stigmas around so many different things. And I think we may have chatted a little bit about this beforehand, uh, before we were recording, but I would really, really like to stay humble on what this can do for people. But the impact I'm hoping to have on, on people is that they can listen to a conversation between us or a conversation between myself and other guests and learn something and Mm -hmm. maybe understand or gather some empathy around a situation they haven't personally experienced or that they have a preconceived notion about. And my vision is to have people learn empathy, learn Mm -hmm. understanding and learn gratitude. But ultimately, um, you know, if, if I can impact one person with this, then it's worth all the time, effort and resources that go into it. Love it. My oh, man, you, you've, uh, you've built a wonderful platform and, and anytime I get to meet people that have built a platform and want to use it for good, it's, um, warms my heart, especially yeah. around the topic of gratitude. Yeah. And I, I think that, um, again, you're helping to break the stigma, uh, normalize mental health. It's especially difficult, I think for men, which you would probably agree. Uh, it's a, mm-hmm. a little more of a stigma or a different type of stigma. I would say so. I, I thank you for that and what you do. And, um, you know, everyone listening, I know does too. So uh, I guess that's, uh, that can be a wrap for us. And I want to thank you so much, Chris, for joining us. Do you want to tell people where they can find uh, gratitude through hard times and your latest book and even uh, pasta and, and gratitude? Gratitude pasta. Uh, gratitude you and pasta. can, I mean, just, just go to Amazon is good enough. Uh, gratitude and pasta uh, or gratitude through hard times. Both are available on Kindle and in, in, uh, in physical format. Um, if you just Google Chris Shembra, you'll see our LinkedIn. Feel free to reach out. Um, feel free to follow along the journey there. If you Google Chris Shembra, you'll see we run um, some pretty amazing columns at Rolling Stone Magazine, at Fast Company Magazine. We're definitely really proud of, of that work. We've got a, a wonderful editorial team over there that really crafts our message and shares pretty impactful things. So those are very easy articles to pick up in a magazine or share on the internet or whatever you want to do. But, awesome. uh, yeah, you know, it's, um, you know, Nick, what I think we got to do at some point is probably, probably look ahead, um, you know, to this community. And what I'll do is I'll just, I'll donate a virtual gratitude experience, um, for your community. What we should do is, is, you know, make a, make a big post and, funnel a couple hundred people into a virtual gratitude experience and oh, bring man, them the principles so of gratitude great. in this way. I'd, I'd love to give that to you guys. That would be great. We should, we should definitely do that. So keep an eye and out folks. Keep an and, eye out. Uh, <laughs> Coming soon. It'll probably right. be at seven, seven forty seven in someone's time zone. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> uh, thanks again, Chris, for joining us. Uh, if you all enjoyed this conversation, be sure to check YouTube, Apple, podcast, Spotify, anywhere you get your podcast. And thanks again, Chris, for a great conversation. And we'll do this again sometime soon. And if you join us next week, we'll have another great guest and another great conversation. So thank you all very much. Thank you for joining me on another episode of Conversations with Nick Thompson. If you enjoyed the show, be sure to follow us and leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Links can be found in the description below and we can't wait to see you next time.